Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Afternoon Astronomy Coffee Hangout, which is our bi-weekly discussion of the latest discoveries in the world of astronomy. Each hangout, we bring to you experts from the membership of the American Astronomical Society in a forum that allows you direct access to professional astronomers from all fields of astronomy. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and I'll be your friendly moderator today, where we will be talking about the recent discovery using data from the Galileo mission to Jupiter, where astronomers have just found evidence of water plumes on the Jovian moon, Europa. A place where, as any Arthur C. Clarke fan knows, humanity is supposed to stay away from because it is a promising place for a tarb or life and we're not supposed to bother anything there. Well, we're not. We're just looking. So today we'll be talking with the astronomers who made the discovery and we'll address a topic that I think is going to be the future of astronomy using enormous the enormous reservoir of astronomy data that's being collected by spacecraft probes, rovers, telescopes, both on the ground and in space to find out new things about the universe that we never knew were there and all along only to find out that the discovery was sitting on a hard drive in a mission data archive somewhere. <laughs> so I want to welcome all of our live viewers and I hope you'll send us lots of questions and comments over the next hour for our guests and if you're watching after the event's over, I want to welcome you as well, and please feel free to leave questions in our comment section below, and I will read them and try to answer them. So, okay, so let me bring up our guests, and uh, and uh, I'll be bringing in, and Dr. Carol Christian, my co-host from the Center for Emerging Media, is going to be joining us a little bit late because she I'm here. is traveling. Oh, yeah, there you are. Oh, wow, I, I was busy doing my intro, and there yeah. you there you popped up. So let me. Let me pull up everybody here. Hi, Carol. Dr. Hey. Carol Christian from the Center for Emerging Media. She helps set these all up. Um, and uh, I just want you to know I'm watching the YouTube live chat as well as our Discord server uh, live. So uh, please feel free to interact with us in that way. Okay. Hey, Carol, how you doing? You don't do hey, it. Um, um, you made it. Well, sorry for being late. Uh, yeah, it was <laughs> racing from one place to another but anyway i'm here and i'm so excited about this hangout this is great Me i think too. that all the things you said i mean europa archives the power of archives um and you know just the cleverness of scientists i think too yeah so. that's exactly right so um we, I, I often do hangouts and I do vlog posts on YouTube and things like that. And one of the things I talk about is, is careers in astronomy, the various things that you can do. If you're a young person, just thinking getting started in astronomy and, and wondering about what kinds of jobs that are out there, this hangout is going to be of interest to you because we're going to talk a little bit later on about data mining and getting to, into the archives and things like that. So let me start introducing everybody uh, in my uh, in my little my, my scientific Brady Bunch uh, outline here. In the upper left um, in the upper left panel is uh, Dr. Christian uh, Karana. He is from UCLA. Next to him in the middle panel on the top row is Dr. William Kurth from the University of Iowa. On the far right panel in the upper row is uh, Dr. Shinja Jia. Uh, from the University of Michigan. He is currently at an airport. Now, Shinja, I may ask you to mute your mic if the background noise starts uh, interfering, but right now it seems to be okay. And in okay. the lower panel right next to uh, Carol is Dr. Margaret Kivelson from University of California at Los Angeles. Hi, Margaret. Okay, I want to talk first about Europa, the moon. Who wants to give us a little summary about this moon and why it's so interesting to astronomers uh, uh, and the general public. We're all, we all love Europa, but for, I think, reasons that have to do with a movie, a certain movie out there. But uh, anyway, who wants to give us a brief introduction into Europa? Anyone? Shinja? Okay, yeah, I can, I can go for it. Uh, uh, first of all, th thanks for, uh, for having me on this. I mean, uh, it's a, a great experience. Um, so Europa is one of the uh, large, four large planets uh, of Jupiter. Uh, it's the second um, in orbital distance if you come from Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and the Callisto. And the Europa, in fact, is the smallest among the four. Uh, it has a radius about 1,000 miles. Um, and one of the fascinating aspects of Europa uh, is that through Galileo, uh, measurements. Uh, I'll probably will talk about this later uh, in a, a bit more detail. Uh, this moon appears to have a global subsurface ocean, 
And so that has, um, I think, uh, generated a lot of interest uh, in terms of whether or not Europa has the kind of conditions that can uh, be suitable for life. So I think that's probably a, a, a brief introduction to, to Europa. And when you say ocean, we're talking water now, H2O, not sulfuric acid or methane or any of that stuff, right? We're talking water oceans. Correct. Yeah, yes. that's and that's particularly exciting. And so I, there was a comment in here uh, with, that I just wanted that kind of gets to uh, the the next. I think it was Achilles. Yeah, Achilles three hundred eight is just com- uh, asking real quick. This discovery was really exciting. Uh, the, this finding of plumes. How come it? Well, maybe maybe I'll get to that question in a minute, Achilles. I, we should, let's talk about the discovery itself. So. Uh, who can tell us the story of that? I know, Xinjiang, you're the first author on the paper, which I think is a nature paper, correct? So, uh, unfortunately, guys, you know I like to give you a link so you can follow along on the paper as we're doing the Hangout. Unfortunately, nature won't let us do that uh, for copyright reasons, so I don't have a link for you. But um, I do have a link in the description box of the press release from NASA, so you can follow along and read that. Um, so... Uh, Let's talk about the discovery itself. How, how, what was the discovery, and then how did you find it? Who wants to give us that story? Well, I can say a few words. Okay, go ahead, you, Margaret. Oh, you can hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first we should just comment that the way in which we identified the presence of an ocean at Europa is through the property of what we call, what we call magnetic induction. Um, so magnetic induction is what's used um, in uh, when you walk through uh, the uh, the gate at security at the airport, uh, which I assume that Chinja has just done. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, You've been inducted. <laughs> you're right. And uh, so changing magnetic fields introduce uh, uh, electrical currents and everybody knows an electrical current has to flow in a, a conductor you can't flow uh, electrical current through rubber uh, you have to have something like a metal that conducts electricity and that was uh, the puzzle when we first saw some of the magnetic measurements near Europa was uh, that there Europa seemed to be making uh, a magnetic signature of its own that we uh, were kind of surprised by. And uh, we were able to figure out that it had to be because there was a current flowing very near the surface, and the surface is water ice. So that suggested ice is not a good electrical conductor, but um, uh, an ocean is a pretty good electrical conductor. That's why we don't go swimming in the ocean in a thunderstorm. Uh, so the, that's the background on how we found the uh, ocean at Europa. Does this and, graphic help, help uh, describe what you're talking about, Margaret? The uh, This is a, a, a graphic of Europa it, with Voy- uh, gro- sorry Galileo uh, passing by, and then there are these blue lines. Is this what you meant? Well, it's not exactly what I meant, but oh. it's the kind of thing I mean. Uh, the magnetic field of uh, the, the, in which Europa is moving is represented by these blue lines. And as you can see in this particular uh, artist's impression, what's happened is uh, a plume has uh, developed that is spewing water vapor above the surface, and that water vapor has, is ionized by energetic electrons that are present in the vicinity. And when Galileo passed through this region, it saw that the magnetic field had changed its configuration. It had bent, and that's what tri- uh, the, the images uh, are trying to show, that the magnetic field has twisted and uh, taken a different shape. And it was that that we went back to look at in the Galileo data, 20 years old Galileo data, uh, with the new insight that, uh, that Enceladus had plumes of water vapor spent spewing up from its surface, Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, 
and um, uh, also some Hubble images that had suggested that there was water vapor above the surface. So I'll, I'll stop there and let you ask questions. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get uh, William and uh, Christian in on this a little bit. Uh, do you have any comments about, to make? Uh, let's start with Christian about. Uh, uh, any of the about this discovery, your role in it, what 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 excited you about it? Uh, maybe you know, give us some insight into what what you were doing, what your role was. So, so this is Christian. So um, about twenty years ago, um, when we first got uh, the data, um, we were puzzled right away. Um, uh, this particular flyby was nothing like any other. Uh, the local magnetic field was so perturbed, we were seeing structures called shocklets in it. The magnetic field strength was twice as strong as we expect near Europa. So uh, we were puzzled, but didn't have an answer at that time. We knew uh, there's a notion, and Margaret talked about that, um, for this particular flyby, the effect of the ocean is minimal because in the phase, in the magnetic phase, um, th um, we were at a minimum. Uh, and so the induced field was expected to be quite small. Okay, let and me just, so can I just, can I just press in on that just a little bit? The magnetic phase of the planet Jupiter is that the That's magnetic right. field so, that, the, so, that it's going through? Was so, that a minimum at that time? Right. Yeah. So let me uh, give you a little background on how uh, we do these m measurements and infer an ocean. So we use Jupiter's rotating magnetic field as the primary signal. And uh, Jupiter's magnetic field uh, changes with time because of the rotation of Jupiter and the fact that the dipole magnetic field is tilted. So in the reference plane of Europa, uh, you see a wave. Uh, if you look at the horizontal component, uh, it goes from zero positive maximum uh, towards negative maximum. And uh, uh, the maximum induction signature occurs when the phase is such that we are either in the positive maximum horizontal field or negative horizontal magnetic field. Uh, for this flyby, the horizontal component was close to zero. Oh, no. So, <laughs> Just, yeah. And this... uh, so, which was a good thing because uh, that is yet another complication in the data, which we didn't have. Uh... And so it's very clear that the ocean would not explain these observations. And so we knew uh, quite a while back that the answer wasn't uh, just the ocean. It's present, it shows up in the other right flybys. Uh, but for this flyby, um, the answer had to be something else. And it's important to note that this flyby was the closest one that's ever been to of Galileo or anything uh, to the moon Europa, correct? That's right. This was the closest and, we'd ever uh, been. It was actually designed for um, our experiment. We wanted to go very close to Europa uh, on the upstream side where the plasma is interacting strongly with Europa. And we wanted to understand how that interaction occurs. So that was the original intent for this flyby. Uh, but what we saw was something totally different from what we were expecting. But even then, and to reiterate, back in the back 20 years ago, you didn't know or you didn't see the plumes. These were, you just saw something, you a, a, a magnetic field anomaly, I guess, that you didn't expect. Am I, am I understanding that right? That's right. Okay. So we saw uh, large rotations in the magnetic field, a very strong uh, magnetic field signature, and but we did not have an explanation at that time why this was occurring. Okay, William, I, you haven't said anything yes. yet. You want to? Did you want to comment, or did you want to, Jinja? Go ahead. William. Um, oh yeah, let, 
Uh, yeah, go ahead, William. Well, I should, I should say that um, I work with the plasma wave data, and I realize that people have a tough time understanding uh, what plasma waves are and, and what they can tell us about a plasma. But uh, in this case, it's a fairly simple story. Um, if you take a bell and you hit it with a mallet, it will ring at a particular frequency that's more or less associated with the, the size of the bell. Um, if you could perturb the plasma in the vicinity of Europa in some way, uh, there are certain fundamental modes of that plasma, and one of them is the plasma frequency. And it is very simply related to the number of electrons per unit volume and the mass of an electron, which we know very well. Um, at Europa, we also have to worry about the magnetic field in the vicinity of Europa, but in this case, it's a fairly minor uh, contributor to this basic frequency that we're looking for. So I did a paper uh, back in 2001 that looked at all of our flybys of Europa. And wow. one of the things I did was plotted the, uh, the, the plasma density based on this characteristic frequency that I mentioned. And one of the things that stood out was one particular flyby uh, the density in the vicinity, primarily upstream of Europa, was maybe a factor of five or even more than any of the other flybys, and probably a factor of 10 more than the uh, typical flyby. And in addition, there was a little spike in the, in the, in the, um, the frequency that we were looking at, but it only lasted a minute or two. And um, we were in the business, so to speak, of studying plasma sources from the moons and Io, the, uh, the volcanic moon of Jupiter, is the primary source of plasma and material in the magnetosphere. And you can see a, a very large increase in the density as you go very close to Io, but it's, it's moon scale. It, it's basically the same scale as the size of the moon itself. So we kind of um, more or less ignored this little feature until um, Margie and, and Ginger came back after a while and said, you know, you really ought to go back and look at that feature again. And I think that's how this study kind of got started. Although I will say that it really takes the, the modeling and the simulation that, that Ginger has executed for this paper we're talking about to put all the pieces together and to convince me that what I was seeing was actually um, a localized plume of plasma that uh, I had previously ignored. Okay, so Jinja, I want you to talk about your model here in just a moment. But Bill, I just want to say real quick, the just to just to make sure I'm I'm clear. This this is the same flyby. This blip that you saw that was the close flyby of Europa that we're talking about, right? <laughs> Yes, we call it Europa 12. Europa 12, okay. And so, and you saw this, and then, and then at first you decided just to not pay any attention to it. Uh, well, we, 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 we pointed it out in our paper and kind of threw up our hands and said, we don't really know what to say about it. <laughs> you got it, okay. Uh, okay, so, so Shinja, let's talk about your, your model. And, and I, guess you, I guess you were the one, or the, your models and, and Margaret's uh, put together the context for what what Bill is talking and and uh, what Bill and, and Christian are talking about. Yes, yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so the main the two main data sets we talked about the focus on in this uh, paper were in magnetometer data and the plasma wave data um, from Galileo. And as Christian and Bill just mentioned, when you simply look at the data, you know, uh, for that particular flyby, closest flyby, you already see something that is very strange, unusual, compared to all the other flybys of Galileo uh, of Europa. So, and Margie mentioned this in some of those uh, studies um, that came from Cassini measurements, and that really um, taught us a lot about what's gonna happen if you have a localized plume, uh, how that would interact with magnetic field and plasma. So we had some general knowledge about kind of expectation. If you had a plume in uh, around Europa, uh, this may produce the magnetic signature and the plasma wave signature you saw in the data. 
But to really make sense of that, we have to go for modeling. The reason for that is the environment is very complex in the sense Europa has a thin, a very thin atmosphere. And in the Jovian environment... It has an uh, it atmosphere. Has, it has a thin atmosphere. It has a very thin atmosphere, yes. Wow. And in the, in the ambient environment, Jupiter has this rotating magnetic field that Christian just mentioned. And also embedded in the magnetic field is these charged particles uh, uh, with plasma. So this plasma and carrying magnetic field is constantly flowing towards Europa, interacting with Europa and its atmosphere. And now if you get a plume on top of that, everything becomes coupled. So really drawing sketches and the qual qual qualitative estimates are not sufficient, not enough for us to really make sense, you know, to, to, uh, to show whether or not this is a plume related phenomena. So we have to go for modeling. So the kind of model, yeah, this is a very good one actually to talk about. So the kind of model we have been working on in the last uh, few years was a uh, physics-based model that basically self-consistently simulates the interaction of charged particles with magnetic field. And also in the Europa case, we have to also worry about plasma interacting with the neutral particles, which are the probably the primary uh, constituents coming out of the plume. And they... They're, they're ejected out of above the surface, and some of those will become ionized, but a lot of them may remain neutral. So we have to take that kind of interaction also into account in the modeling, and that's the kind of the thing that makes modeling very, uh, very complex. But we have been developing this type of numerical model, computer model, in, in the past. But our efforts have been actually to uh, trying to understand the kind of a large scale signature around Europa in the magnetic field, in the plasma, the kind of thing Christian mentioned, how does the Jovian plasma interact with uh, Europa as a whole? And as soon as we saw the um, peculiar signals in the magnetic field and the plasma wave measurements, we realized we have to actually incorporate a plume model into this type of computer model we already developed. And that's kind of a, one of the major steps we have taken uh, in order to, in the end, uh, you know, uh, arrive at the conclusion we, we have now. Uh, so the plume model I want to briefly mention, the plume model we uh, came up with in This the is end, what I'm showing now. Um, if you, uh, maybe the other one you have uh, with Europa uh, in the background, uh, yeah, this one. Okay. Perfect. So, as you know, you know this 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 feature, um, the plume itself, the scale size, um, is not very big uh, compared to the size of Europa. So it's a relatively small structure. Um, the previous Hubble images um, show you know hints or signs of uh, plumes in the in some of those images. So actually, we relied on. Uh, some of the constraints uh, obtained from Hubble in terms of size, potential size of the plume, and also, you know, the column density of the plume. So this information has been incorporated into our computer model. So um, were these Hubble observations recent, or? Um... Yes, yeah, so I was talking about. I'm talking referring to the you know the 2014 published paper. Okay. The observation was obtained 2012, and okay. later in 2014 and 16. There are, I think, basically three sets of images that show uh, signs of plumes at different locations, though. But, but they all s seem to show a similar kind of a spatial dimension, if you will. I mean, those plumes look, um, they don't look very big in size. They're more or less a few hundred kilometers in size. So that's kind of a very useful information we had to rely on, because when it comes to modeling, there are a lot of free parameters and we want to eliminate uh, as many as possible. So the information provided by Hubble was very useful in that sense. Could I, could I just back up and ask a question? Um, I find it amazing that the probe went this close, the flyby, just the, the configuration of the flyby. At the time, were those kind of flybys common? Or was this an unusual type of flyby? I mean, I don't have a good perception of what you know, what kind of flybys were happening at the, during the Galileo. It seemed to me Galileo was pretty unique, but anyway, yeah. educate me, educate me. I think Margaret probably can do it. Yeah, well, uh, yes, this was unusual. 
Um, it didn't come right at the beginning of the mission, partly because I think they wanted to um, uh, determine how confident they were uh, in the precision with which they could uh, navigate the spacecraft. Uh, but it, 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 there were a number of flybys that were this close to one moon or another, but only later in the mission. However, I should point out that the Europa Clipper planning is, includes passes that will be even closer for sure. Europa. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's the future NASA mission that's designed to go for New Europa right. specifically, right? It just seemed, it just seemed right. so an amazing thing to me that, that anyway, that you fortuitously got near this plume. I, I, I just find so, it so well, so, so kind of, well, they didn't know it at the time, Carol. They <laughs> that that's what's good. That's I know, right. I know. If, exactly. if we exactly. if we knew there was a plume at that time, uh, we may not have gone this close. We would have <laughs> scared away from it. Oh, for fear of damaging the spacecraft. <laughs> oh, that's the spacecraft. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, what could happen? Something could happen to the spacecraft. Uh, interesting. Okay, well, I just want to take a, a quick break and mention that you are watching an astronaut, the Afternoon Astronomy Coffee Hangout, sponsored and endorsed by the American Astronomical Society. And uh, we each this is our biweekly hangout where each week we talk to you about the latest advances in astronomy. And Carol, now that you're here, do you want to give a little intro into the or give people a little talk about what we're doing and why with these hangouts? Sure. Um, a number of years ago, we had the idea that we really enjoy within our research institutions having um, informal, we of course have formal talks, colloquia and workshops and seminars, um, but we also enjoy talking about uh, research, what's new in research with the experts. And then we, we often talk among our, ourselves, like myself, I'm not a solar system expert, so I enjoy meeting guests in our institution and having a uh, coffee with them. And so we have science coffee. This is a thing that uh, astronomers and all kinds of scientists do on a regular basis in the research institutions. And we thought it would be really great if we could share these kind of informal chats with all kinds of people who might be interested in hearing from the scientists themselves, like what kind of, why they did this research, what they were thinking, what, when they saw the data, what were they thinking about? And, and in this case, use of archives, which is really important because there's all kinds of gems in all kinds of archives from ground-based and space-based satellites. Okay, so. thank you, Carol. I want to get to your questions and comments because they're starting to pile up here. I just want to remind everybody, we, my guests today are Dr. Shinja Jia from the University of Michigan, Dr. Margaret Kivelson from the uh, University of California, Los Angeles, Dr. Christian uh, Kurana, also from UCLA, and Dr. Bill Kurth from the University of Iowa, all of whom got together and discovered, hey, you know what? We saw a plume and we didn't know it until 20 years later, and uh, Shinja came along with some models and said, I, you know what, here's what the plume I think looks like. You know, it, it's funny because was was there ever any idea that there could be plumes on Europa? Because I know when Cassini flew over and settled us, as you mentioned, that was a surprise, right? Nobody expected to see those. I was like, wow, Enceladus, what, look at that. And now, was that any kind of a an impetus to going, well, maybe maybe that is what happened on Europa. Maybe that's why these anomalies were brought about. Anyone comment? Well, I, I think, um, at least for myself, I won't speak for my esteemed colleagues because they probably have a more open mind than I do, but I think it's really hard to, to, th to think out of the box. If you go back to the original flybys of these spacecraft, of these um, uh, giant planets by Voyager, for example, I think the initial idea was that the Galilean satellites and the other moons of the outer planets would all look like our own moon. There'd be a lot of craters, they'd be gray and boring. <laughs> uh, as it turned out, there is no such thing as a boring satellite of an outer planet. They're all different. Uh, they all have different uh, characteristics. I mentioned Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Um, we discovered we discovered that there's geysers uh, from the moon Triton in, in orbit at Neptune uh, with with Voyager. 
That's the only example that we have of anything like a plume prior to the Galileo mission at, at Jupiter. And I think once the geysers at Enceladus were found by, um, in fact, by the magnetometer experiment on, on Cassini originally, uh, that maybe this isn't such a strange concept after all. And um, I know that, uh, that Margie and Jinja had, had been thinking about this problem and in particular E12 for quite some time. And uh, before we actually got around to putting all the data back together and, and putting it into Z Jinja's model. Bill, I'm getting the impression that you took some convincing about this. I did. <laughs> did you have to, yeah. you had to, you had to work on Bill, didn't you, Jinja? <laughs> we did. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is true. I mean, uh, uh, as Bill said, you know, he, uh, he published this paper back uh, 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago. And, but I think really, you know, we have to do a very careful job of uh, modeling. I mean, convince ourselves, I mean, myself included. Um, so, and my co-authors also, you know, we have to really uh, do a kind of a very careful job of, of developing the model and then really analyzing the model results. And, you know, I have to say, it's never, it's never the case that when you put up a model, it works right away the first time. So there are a lot of things going on. There are a lot of uh, uh, processes that we need to understand and tuning parameters and in which direction, in which way you have to adjust your, your modeling parameters. And all these are kind of a part of the, part of the effort in the end. Uh, but I'm glad, you know, the, in the end, we, I think we, 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 we find the solution. And I think it's... Uh, um, but throughout, I think it's a, it was an amazing, amazing process, procedure. Okay. Uh, let, me get to a, let me get to some questions here. I'm going to start with Galaxia. Hi, Galaxia. It's good to see you again. Uh, what is the period of Jupiter's magnetic phase? And when you were talking about it, I, started, I was thinking a lot about the solar magnetic cycle. Uh, is it anything like that? Or, you know, does it have a period? And if so, what is it? So let, let me... Okay, uh, go ahead. Because I introduced that concept. So... The magnetic field comes from Jupiter. It's not changing um, much at all. We actually have not detected any secular variation in Jupiter's magnetic field. However, the magnetic dipole is tilted with respect to its rotation axis. So at any location, the magnetic field seen by an observer is not constant just because the dipole tilt. So one would see stronger and weaker magnetic field. And that has a period of about 11 hours near Europa. And uh, But you just said is, it's not changing much. I'm confused. That's right. But uh, it's the uh, relative, uh, it's the strength observed uh, by an observer. That changes. Uh, depending, depending on where you are or where you are relative to Jupiter. Yeah. In longitude. I see. Okay. And, and so at certain longitude, you see a stronger component at other longitude, you see a weaker component, but there's still as Jupiter you... rotates. I'm sorry, go ahead. And as Jupiter rotates, uh, you see all the phases of Jupiter, uh, all the longitudes of Jupiter and those uh, create the magnetic phasing for us. Got it. So it's the rotation rate of the of the planet, and of it's, the planet. and the fact that it's tilted give you these variations as it rotates. That's right. Got right. it. Okay. And, and the fact that the field is not axisymmetric, um, so you do require that as well. Okay. Uh, Condor Boss is asking a loaded question. He wants to know: Have you been able to get? Any spectra of the plumes, and if so, there's some wishful thinking here, uh, any organic molecules been identified? I think if we had found those, we would know. Uh, any spectra? Yeah, there are. In fact, the, um, the can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the, the Hubble, uh, some, one, one of the Hubble papers reports uh, looking at Europa at a time when Jupiter was behind it, uh, so that Earth, Europa, and Jupiter were lined up. And the radiation from Jupiter 
had to go through the plume to uh, to reach the oh, earth. Wow, I bet that was and amazing. And there were absor- there were spectral bands that were absorbed that were consistent with water water vapor. Wow, that's really cool. And was this done with stis, uh, or do you know what the was this? Is that what it was, Carol? Do you, think? Do you remember? I think it was most likely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Achilles three hundred eight is asking: Does the signal have any indication of maybe salts or other ions in the plume, enhancing the magnetic induction effect? Good question. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think no, no no relevant measurements have been made, but upcoming missions certainly will. We'll make those measurements. The clipper again, right? The though, though, though clipper let me again. Add, yeah. Though let me add about magnetic induction part of it. Uh, even if there were salt, was salt in that water, uh, the induction effect of such a small plume would be uh, almost negligible. Okay. So we were not expecting to see induction effect from the plume. Uh, what we are seeing is what is called the plasma interaction. <laughs> it's the magnetic field basically hangs on the plume and uh, creates its own uh, winglet. We call it the alphane wing, a small wing, uh, which um, uh, Shinja detected very at the closest approach time. Okay. I'm laughing at you, uh, Paranor001. He comments, and I get the reference, it's only a model. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> uh, Monty Python okay um, what's the gravity on Europa compared to Earth this is from Ark Hades oh. roughly one sixth of the Earth yeah. so about moonish yes mm-hmm. moonish. Uh, Europa and our moon are very similar mm-hmm. um, similar sizes similar densities okay but uh, uh, although our Moon does not have an icy outer layer, so that's a big difference. Right, right. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, cosmic lettuce. Um, how do you know that it's an outgoing plume? That it's an outgoing plume from the moon and not something incoming from the outside. Good, good question. How do you know the the, the direction, the speed, the velocity vector? How do you know it's going away from the moon and not well, falling back in? I don't think we we don't really know uh, from actual measurements, but it's a lot easier to understand how you might construct a plume by um, shooting material that we believe is in the interior of the moon outwards, as opposed to understanding how we could organize um, a plume of material, including water. Uh, and targeting a uh, local uh, region on the moon. I think it's um, very difficult to understand how you would turn the problem around and and basically point a fire hose at at Europa. Where's the fire hose and and who's pumping the water? Okay. Uh, Is this live live? Yes, it is live live. Okay, I th- uh, sailboat diaries. I think Venus should be top of our list. 50 kilometers up, there's a habitable environment. We just need to drop the idea of living on the surface. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that would be <laughs> challenging, at the, to say the least. Um, but but good, good comment. Um, if you want, let's see, Peter Quinn, if you want to be melted away by acid rain, it's fine. <laughs> you need to be an ORAC or you need to be, you'll need a... Uh, oh, sorry, I don't I can't, I can't read that one, so I'll just move on. Sorry about that, Peter Quinn. Uh, Joe Schmo, so that implies that the molecular layers of Jupiter's influence characteristics. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand that one either. Uh, I don't. Uh, let's see. Oh, Condor Boss is asking, when does the Clipper launch? The Europa Clipper. That's coming. Christian, you want to take that? Yeah, that's that's a brand new mission that has been approved yeah, by I NASA in the budget, and I think so, they're in the early so stages of it now. The the tentative um, launch dates are in 22, 23 kind of time frame. However, they may change depending upon the launch vehicle. Um, there are proposals to use the SLS launch vehicle. And that would could happen much sooner, as soon as 
20 or early 21 and will also get us there sooner because it will be on a direct trajectory to Jupiter. That's going to be such an amazing mission. I can't wait for that to happen. I was happy to hear it got approved. So, uh, yeah, so 2020, 2021, maybe, uh, if, if all goes well. So, um, oh, all right, so keep your questions coming. I'm going to... Um, I'm going, sorry, I need to get closer to the microphone. Uh, I need to get, um, I want to talk about this idea of data mining. And one of the important aspects of this discovery, in my opinion, was that not only did you discover something that you didn't understand in the data at first, but then later, uh, later on, you were able to, uh, you know, figure out what it was using past 20 year old data. This is going to be, I think, a sign of the times, because imagine, folks, we're taking so much data from not just these past space missions that have come and gone, Cassini's come and gone, Galileo's come and gone, uh, New Horizons has left Pluto, but it's on its way to a, a KBO, and these missions have collected a lot of data that are sitting on archives in various places, and we have probably recorded discoveries already sitting on a hard drive somewhere that it's going to take someone to go through and interpret and to find what we already know. Now, as I was mentioning to the guests earlier before we started this hangout, this isn't a new idea. Uh, for those of you who have heard me talk about the SOHO spacecraft many, many times, it's a, it's a spacecraft at the L1 point staring at the sun, has been for 25 plus years, 26 plus years. Actually, it's as old as Hubble, so up there as long as Hubble. Uh, people have been using the LASCO chronograph data to discover comets, and they just go through the, the, the C2 and C3 images, and they can find sun-grazing comets this way. Uh, so this, I think, is a really important skill to be able to develop if you are new to astronomy and you're thinking about a career in astronomy. Data processing, data handling skills are going to be an important part of getting science done. Now, this is my opinion, and I'd like to get you guys' opinion on what I just said. How do you guys feel? And I'll, and, um, I'll start with you, Christian. Uh, what do you think about this, comp this idea that data mining, data handling skills are going to be very important in science going forward? Uh, no doubt about that. And uh, I, I have to uh, put a pitch here for Bill Kurth, who actually <laughs> recognized um, this aspect uh, almost two decades ago. They persuaded NASA to start something NASA calls the planetary data system. And it's a data archive. And that's where Galileo data is, by the way, right? That's right. Okay. That's where you that find the question, Galileo Cosmic data. Lettuce. Yeah. And uh, every spacecraft that ventures out of the solar system, uh, that data is archived at many different nodes uh, in the planetary data system. Anyone can go uh, look at the data. For example, this discovery we are dis talking about, uh, anyone could have made by going and extracting that data and analyzing it. So yes, data mining um, is a a major effort of future. Uh, what that requires is data uh, archived in correct format, in a very easily retrievable format. And Bill Kurth and uh, locally here in UCLA, uh, Ray Walker, uh, they were instrumental. A long time ago, they persuaded NASA to get the right architecture for these data systems. And as a result, these data are beautifully available, easily available to anyone who would like to use it. Bill, so he gave you a shout out. Uh, Christian gave you a shout out. Did you just happen to remember? Because this is, you know, you, I, I, you're getting this feeling like you just sort of know the data uh, that's out there in your head. Did you just happen to remember this flyby and go, you know, there was this anomaly there? Is that how? Well, I, I'll admit to having going back, gone back and, and read my own paper to remember what I put in it. Uh, <laughs> Oh but in, re in response to uh, <clears throat> to um, Christian's very kind words, I will have to say that uh, storing the data themselves is only part of the problem. Um, perhaps in a larger part of the problem is having access to the software that allows you to actually 
do something reasonable with the data. Here, here. I, I, have, uh, I have to. I have to tell you that I get a request maybe every six months to answer somebody's question about Galileo data, and I'll be darned if I don't have to go find a programmer and say, "Why doesn't this program work today?" Because it worked six months ago when I asked you the last time, and. Um, you know, archiving software is, I think, a much tougher problem than archiving the data. No, oh, that's, that's a that's a that's a topic of a whole different hangout. But I could not agree more. I'm a software well, engineer myself. Right. But, but let me let me make one other comment. Uh, since our audience here are primarily astronomers, and I'm going to make a uh, a generalization here, and you can criticize me if I'm wrong. But uh, by and large, astronomers have framing. Uh, uh, imagers. They take pictures, they have an XY component and a spectral component, perhaps. Uh, the instruments that you've heard about today on Galileo are both time series instruments. A string of numbers. Uh, the magnetometer measures the magnetic field as a function of time, and even worse, it's a function of space, and it's a function of attitude. Uh, plaza waves are similar in the sense that that um, at least part of that spectrum, you're flying through disturbances in a medium as you move along. At higher frequencies, you're actually looking at radio waves that come to you from uh, a distant location like the auroral zones of Jupiter. Um, and I would say out of the, I can't remember exactly how many instruments there were on Galileo, but there were uh, approximately half of them were not framing type instruments. They, they measured energetic particles and their energies and what directions they were came, coming from and so on. And um, it's a real problem with the planetary data system was understanding how to grab, uh, grasp all of these different types of data from different types of instruments and make them available in, in a way that they can be easily accessible. So to the extent that you can develop tools, folks, to handle these data and to let scientists ask general science questions of the data, you will become a rock star because that is a, that is a problem. Software, I, I, when, I, when I was in the field working, I could not believe the amount of software still written in Fortran, written 40 years ago, and if it didn't run, they couldn't do their paper. So it's, it's it, you know, we need software uh, designers and engineers who can let the interface between the data and the scientist be as easy but accurate as possible. Now, Shenzhen, you and maybe Margaret too, you guys had these observations and you had a model or did you have your model first? And then what? how did that work? How did you compare your model with the data and which came first? I, I think that um, the interpretation, the speculation came first. I, I just found some uh, PowerPoint slides that we made quite a long time ago, which are just pencil sketches of how the magnetic field would be affected if the spacecraft had flown through a plume that had been uh, well ionized. And we played around with, uh, with ideas of how it ought to look and then decided it was good enough that all, all the effort that uh, was required to make a model was worth doing. Any comments, Do Shinju? Uh, uh, Shinju? Yes, yeah, I, uh, yeah what, what the Margaret said was exactly what had happened. I want to add, you know, if I, if I may, uh, to the discussion that Christian and the, and the Bill uh, just made in terms of data uh, science, data mining. And, you know, in addition to this traditional uh, data collected by spacecraft and the telescopes, we're also now producing huge amount of data from computer simulations. So software, including numerical codes that are used to produce the simulation results are also, uh, you know, instrumental in many ways. And we ought to find a way also to archive probably numerical codes and maybe numerical simulation output. And I know there have been talks being uh, made you know, among different committees. And I think the, the awareness has been raised um, to a point that a lot of us recognize the importance of you know, archiving 
uh, simulation models and their output. So just like you do with satellite data, so maybe in the end, you know, we'll find uh, new discoveries among those simulation output you didn't originally uh, intend to. Yeah. And uh, one plot is commenting, so astronomers can now find new exoplanets or observations by scrolling through old data sets rather than watching the skies. Paradoxical. No, it's not paradoxical because that data came from watching the skies, just at various wavelengths and in various locations. And uh, it's not paradoxical, but it is important because these data are coming down from all kinds of store sources, being used by the principal investigators, whether it's, an, whether it's a Hubble orbit or whether it's a, 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 a flyby of Juno, whatever it happens to be, or whether it's a night at a telescope in Chile. They're doing their science, but then it's sitting there and it's going to an archive, most of the time it's available after a year or some sort of embargo period to everybody. And it sits in all kinds of different areas uh, where you can access it and do things with it yourself. And I don't know, it used to be a thing called the National Virtual Observatory. I think it became a virtual observatory. Uh, maybe there was a, a worldwide observatory. But anyway, it was this idea of plugging in all of these data sets into one portal and you could get data from everywhere. I don't know whatever happened to those. I don't even know if they still exist. But individual... Yes, well, okay. I Go do ahead, Carol. Because that effort was... Uh, the, at the international level, it still exists. Does it? And, okay. And the, the But that requires... As Bill said, it's not just data storage. It's that you have to have... Um, software that searches and helps analyze and that has already been incorporated into the American data archives and many of the European data well many archives around the world um, and that group still meets and talks about the the things that are necessary to make those things all work together uh, okay so uh, and they work with varying levels of success but I still think it's better if you just go to like the MAST archive that, that's run at the Institute uh, where you can query for Hubble data as well as PanStars and a few other data sets, uh, Kepler data is there. And then there's the planetary data system, the PDS, which houses some of this older stuff. Uh, is that where Voyager data is by any chance? Certainly, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Some Voyager, Voyager are there, yes. Okay. Pioneer data, yes. Pioneer, wow, that's going way back. Uh, Joe Schmo is commenting, I haven't heard Fortran mentioned since the Y2K scare. Listen. It's out there. Fortran is still being used today. In fact, when the Mac OS stopped uh, letting the G77 compiler run, I had to start getting a lot of people to code to compile under G Fortran. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. But I was like, you ever heard of maybe maybe this thing called Python? We might want to start looking into that. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it, the, the software is a problem. And this ability to not only maintain it, but keep it relevant, keep it so you can compile it and with today's computers and run like some analysis routines I've noticed in these data uh, are run with specific sets of software. Papers are written based on this software that was written usually by an astronomer and run to run their data, whether it's IDL or whether it's in uh, uh, Fortran or C or, or Perl or whatever it happens to be. And then that code after the paper's written, and you guys please comment on what I'm saying, uh, you know, the, this this code just kind of sits there written as it was, and then somebody else wants to kind of do that work, and they get this code, and they have to work on getting it to run again. And Bill, you were alluding to that, right? That you have to, people are trying to use Galileo data, you have to figure out why code that doesn't work anymore. So do you spend a lot of your time getting old code to work? Well, I, I spent a lot of my time getting our programming staff to get old code to work. Okay, that's what I meant. <laughs> Not you personally. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll have to say just just uh, there's no scientific comment in this comment, but um, uh, Margie Kibbleson was the last person to ask me for a deck of punch cards. You remember that, Margie? Wow, you actually needed punch cards. <laughs> Who has a punch what card reader? <laughs> There's just one other thing that I think is worth mentioning about old data, and that is that we have very limited amounts of data from these planetary environments like Jupiter and Saturn. But we can put together the data from successive spacecraft to get a much better picture of how the process 
and the system work, we can look for temporal changes by looking at old data and comparing it with more current data, or we can look at uh, spacecraft that have explored different parts of the system that we're interested in. So that's another major use of old data. Oh, good comment. Okay. Uh, I'm going through the comments now, um, and I'm not seeing any new questions. So let me just ask you guys, um, uh, what? where do we go from here, guys? Uh, Shinja, do you have um, new models? Uh, do you have other data that you'd like to explore to maybe sort of nail down these plumes? Is there, Or is this it? Was this a one-time shot? We just happen to be going through a plume at a key point in the orbit of, with Galileo? What's the future hold? And it's certainly, I think, that there's still a lot of things about Europa that need to be uh, understood. And I think in terms of modeling effort, I would, I would like to uh, continue um, on those efforts, you know, developing uh, better models with more physics included for Europa. Because, you know, in anticipation of Clipper, Europa Clipper mission coming along in a few years, we're going to have a huge amount of data uh, for Europa. And to, again, interpret those data, we need good models. So I think these efforts should be uh, maintained. And um, to other question about whether or not other uh, your current available data about the Europa can tell us uh, anything about plumes. And I think that it's probably worth us uh, still looking into the data sets that are available from Galileo. Um, other flybys that are not so close as this one, this one is the closest one we had. But maybe other kind of indirect uh, encounter of, of plume proper materials, uh, I think it's worth looking. Um, I think we probably will, will continue this this uh, analysis this project. If you had to guess, what percentage of Galileo data has not been gone through? If you guys had to guess, is, is it all been gone through in some way, or is there still some hidden files somewhere that people still need to look at? Sorry, that was my phone. I, I'd be surprised if if all the data has not been looked at in some cursory manner by now. That's yeah. not to say that there aren't other studies that one could do that have not been done using them. That's true. And that's what's so great about having it available to everyone is that you can have an idea or a model and, and put it to the data and see how it matches. Uh, Shinja, let me just ask real quick about uh, um, Enceladus. Is your model uh, relevant to the plumes on Enceladus or not? Um, I think that this uh, particular model we have utilized, the core of the model uh, has been used actually back a few years ago to model in some of those plumes, uh, but not by me. Uh, uh, I'm not involved in those modeling studies, but the same core, same type of model has been utilized to study in some of those plumes. So you learn a lot by you know, uh, having such a self-consistent model that deals with plasma interacting with magnetic field and the neutral particles. Okay, uh, great. Um, Carol, did you have anything else you'd like to add or ask before I say bye-bye? No, I think um, it, it will be very interesting to see how this all unfolds. And I, I guess I'm really excited that this data, that you found this and reanalyzed it because the Europa HST observation was, you know, done by a very careful team, but to have this corroboration from another satellite is just amazing. I just find the whole scenario just amazing, and I think you all are just so clever for having done this, and I really appreciate you coming on to the to the hangout. I mean, this is really yes, great. I would like so, to great, it. great. It's going to be a lot of fun I'd to like watch to what goes on. Definitely echo that sentiment. Okay, well, we are out of time, and I'm going to stop it here. Uh, I want to thank our guests, uh, Dr. Shinja Jia from the University of Michigan, Dr. Margaret Kivelson from the UCLA, Dr. Christian Kurana, from, uh, also from UCLA, and Dr. William Kurth from the University of Iowa, who have all been using old, older Galileo data and Hubble observations to made a discovery of plumes of water coming off the moon, the Jovian moon, Europa. And so it's been great. This has been awesome. It makes makes it even more exciting destination for the Europa Clipper when it hits in the early 2020s. And uh, we're, we'll hopefully, uh, if you guys go through more data, find more plumes, please let us know and, and come back and let's talk about them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so thank you all very much for joining us on the, in the Hangout. I really appreciated it. Yeah, and really. Carol and I are off next week, but we'll, I'll be back with Future in Space the first week of June. 
Houston. Uh, Thursday, we're, uh, Harley and I, I think we're talking about a gateway in space uh, uh, with from ESA, I think. But I will, I will have to, uh, we're still finalizing the guests on that. So we will not be here next week, but we will be the, fo- the following Thursday. So that's it. And thank you all so much for watching. And on behalf of Carol and my guests, keep looking up. (laughs) Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us.